Hey, you can turn to uh, uh, Galatians. You may know we're there. We've got a lot of new people here. We've got grandparents here. We've got babies. We've got all kinds of stuff happening today. But it's a new ministry, new school year, all the things, new ministry year. I don't know what that does for you. I get pretty hyped. I mean, you all know I kind of stay hyped. But um, uh, I don't know if it makes you anxious. I know for me, I, I'm, I'm already seeing, man, I've got to have some balance. I need some rest. I need, uh, you know, I, I need to make sure I'm taking care of myself. Uh, I want to exercise, you know, eat properly, all the, all the things. And then there's all the things. There's so many things like you don't even think about. Um, and as you look at your health, if you track that much or as you get older or something, you understand, some of y'all know there's like good cholesterol um, and, and bad cholesterol. Like I think HDL is the good. Uh, some doctors can help me here. LDL is the bad. And you're, you don't even know what's going on. Like, you, you, like when you're younger, you're like, I don't even know what that means. And you, there aren't really any symptoms to know how you're doing. Do you have a high cholesterol or not? Uh, you have to be tested for it. A lot of things in life are that way. Kind of, kind of good and bad. There's good fear. There's, there's bad fear. Fear that keeps you from doing something just straight up crazy. And fear that just uh, might, might just, just terrify you and keep you from doing anything. And we all live uh, maybe in those, uh, some tension there. Um, there's, there's good and bad uh, pride, right? Like you can have, you're proud of your kids, proud of the work you've done. But there's a point at which there's this arrogance. You can, you can be proud of your football team, right? Uh, or not. And this is probably a good time of the year. My annual reminder, don't find your worth and your value in a group of 18, 20-year-olds running around on a football field. This is not a place to do it. Not going to help you a whole lot, right? And you're not strapping on a helmet anyway. So anyway, um, uh, all that said, though, th this whole thing, what we're going to talk about today is pride. Because there's good pride, there's bad pride. And, and how do you live in the tension? Is there a tension? Or maybe is there a third way? How do you recognize pride? Like cholesterol, evidently you can't. You don't know if you have high cholesterol. You've got to be tested for it. And so what are the tests for pride? I've never had anyone come into my office as a pastor and say, I set up this appointment, pastor, because I, you know, I, I hear a lot of confession. A lot of people want to come and say, man, pray over me. It happened this morning. Um, but I've never had anyone come in and say, Jeff, I'm just, man, I'm the most prideful person I know. And I, I mean, pride is wrecking my relationships. It's, you know, it's, it's just controlling my life. And I want, to, I want to learn how to be humble. I'm so prideful. I never hear anybody say that. And yet pride is the root of all sin. I heard someone say that pride and sin both have, the, have I right in the middle. And though it's hard to identify, you can't self-identify pride a lot. So when we're back now in relationships in a packed house here or getting in small groups or whatever else, our sin is going to be revealed. So you have this tension within the body that says, uh, we're called to close relationships, but in close relationships, how about this? Especially in marriage, marriage is like a mirror, right? You get married and you can't hide anymore. You can't hide all your faults, all your sin, all your garbage, your pride. And it reveals it and you can't, you can't get away from it. And again, it's why some people, I'd rather just be alone, like most of the time. And we shrivel up and die in loneliness. How do you live in the tension? Or is there a third way altogether where we can learn how to get a grip on pride? Religious people have pride. Because oftentimes we move to our Christian types. You know, often, well, I'm, I have this higher morality now. And I live this, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I, I, I know better than you. And we have this judgmental, condemning spirit. Irreligious people flip it the other way and just go, well, I'm not one of them. I'm not, you know, all legalistic. I'm not, I don't, don't, don't do all the while judging, condemning others, right? Pride plays out for all people. And then there's often this false humility that, that, that is this self-loathing and self-condemnation. So how do we live in this? And is there a way that we can diagnose, here's what we'll do. What are the symptoms of pride? Um, what's the solution to pride? And then I want to land on what was the standard for a life without pride? What does that look like? It's all in the text we're going to look at today. A lot of you are new. We're going to be in Galatians 5, starting with verse 25. 525. Now, I've got to put us in context because some of us are brand new today. Um, if you know much about the book of Galatians, Paul's been on repeat about the fact that we are justified by faith, not by our works. Now, we hear that and immediately, listen, this is so important. 
We hear that and we think that's a lot of theological kind of stuff, philosophical, theoretical stuff, the spiritual stuff. We're justified by what Christ has done for us through his perfect life, death on the cross. He has made a way by his grace for us to be justified before holy God. Not because of anything we've done. Receiving that by faith, not works, the grace of God. And you go, yeah, that's theological, doctrinal stuff. I get it. But listen, no, 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 no. This is at the heart of the human experience. Every single one of us are trying to justify ourselves all the time. And that's the word. We try to validate our existence. It's what Paul says. Watch this. Don't miss this. This is what it means to live under the law. Now, because a lot of times we've been thinking, even through this series, we're probably, I don't live under the law. I'm not, I've never been a Jew. I don't, I'm not, we don't follow the law. I'm not under the law. No, no, no. This is an entire schema, an entire worldview that says, I have to do this, do this, and do this in order to justify myself before God, my maker, or if, if I don't believe, uh, just before other people. Here's what's wild. This has hit me recently, where we've talked about freedom. A lot of people in, in Dallas, most of us even maybe here, we think freedom's doing whatever you want to do. Like some of you, maybe you're a freshman in college, maybe you're here in Dallas, you know, you go to SMU or somewhere. It's like, you know, freedom, college, no parents, you know. And we all have stories, most of, of how that went for us, you know, where we finally were released. We had freedom, and we don't handle freedom well. But most people think freedom is doing whatever you want to do. We've said that freedom is not doing what you want to do. It's doing what you ought to do. Now, oughtness demands that there's this authority outside of ourselves, right? And I've noted that over 50% of all Americans now believe in there's, there's no absolute truth. It's all relative. Your truth up against my truth. So I'm left to, to the, you know, for me to, uh, to determine my identity, my purpose, my meaning in life. And what's interesting, though, we believe, most people now believe, I can figure this out internally. I'm the one who decides what's right or wrong. I can determine what the purpose of my life, all the things. And then, watch this, we flip it and we look externally then to validate ourselves. We, like, justify ourselves based on our performance, based on the approval of others, based on my best life. I'm living on social media. We seek validation. Justification is the word. From every, that's life under the law is what that is. Because he says there's a way that we live. Here's how, he, here's how he talks about it. Let's talk about symptoms of pride. Okay, we'll get there. Symptoms of pride. Here's how he summarizes it. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. If you've been here, all, his summary statement really out of chapter 5 so far here is that. Okay, if we're saved by grace at the beginning of chapter 5, verse 1, uh, if we've been set free in Christ, he's called us to now freedom in him. Or to live in this freedom, it means to keep in step with the Spirit, not under the law. He has said, if you live under law, it leads to the desires of the flesh, not the desires of the Spirit. And if, you, if you're with us, again, a little summary here, the word desires there is the word epithumia in the Greek, which means a super desire, an over desire. A lust is how we translate it because we're hypersexual, I guess, and we think sex and we think lust. But watch this, the spirit lusts too. The spirit has super desire. What are the super desires of the spirit? We, we said last week, it's to point us to Christ. The role of the spirit is to, in our lives to constantly remind us of God's love for us in Jesus. The spirit came to say, look at him, behold him, right? Just keep looking at him and how much he loves you. But look at how Paul's going to tell us how we can diagnose, okay, symptoms of pride. And it happens when we get close in relationships with others. Watch this, verse 26. Let us not be conceited. There's the word. Let us not be prideful, provoking one another and envying one another. The word conceited, now we don't always do this, but this helps us. Kinodoxia, uh, doxio. It's a, it's a word in the Greek. Uh, kino means empty. Okay, or vain is how it's translated sometimes. Uh, empty, absent, and then doxa, you might know doxology. Doxa, doxoi is the word here, but doxa is um, glory. So what it means is, it means pride, it's self-boasting, has this sense of delusions, of grandeur. But I think the best translation in, 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 in all of my studies here is the old King James, I think, says it. Vain glory. We don't use that term anymore. But this is what the word means. Vain, you know, empty glory. No glory. 
No, no glory. So here, here's what he's saying here. Pride is this, this, this desire to, okay, I, I have this sense within me that I am empty and I need other things in my life to fill me up. Again, performance, approval. This is the way of the law that leads to the desires of the flesh. So it, it's, it's groundless conceit, someone has said. It's pretension, right? We've all heard um, keep Austin weird, right? Uh, I've heard folks say, well, keep Dallas pretentious is, is what, you know, what, what we do. Um, pretentious is like m- making yourself out to be something you're not, greater than you actually are. Now, we all know, we all know that all of us here in Dallas are, are really awesome. So I don't know how to apply that, but uh, we're, just, we're amazing is who we are. And um, so I'm not sure how to apply this, but, but I have, listen, how can we, how can we live, get out of this cyclical pattern of self-justification? Because what we all do, is there another way to live? Can we get out from under the law? It leads to pride. And, all, and, and he's going to tell us how this happens is there another way to live? I got good news for you. There's, there's good news. Because what, what he's saying here is this. Here, this word helps us, and here's how you can diagnose your own life and, and recognize pride. What's, what's driving this conceit, this pride, is a sense of emptiness within us that you're trying to fill. You're, you're desperate for others' validation. Here's the word, justification. Right, and the thing we need, listen. The thing we all need more than anything in the world, and you, don't, you know, believer or not, you know, atheist, what, atheist, Christian, every human being wants to hear the well done of God the Father. The well done of the Father is the cry of the human heart, because He's created us with this homing device that says, "There's a God," and. And I need to be forgiven. I need to be, there it is, validated. My existence needs to be justified. And we run to all kinds of ways to do this. This is Blaise Pascal's um, a God-shaped vacuum. There's a God-shaped hole within every one of us. And Augustine, again, is the one who said, until we find him, we'll never find rest until we find it in God. And, and as you're thinking with me here, we're assessing what are the symptoms of pride? Pride is this thing that he said. So what do we do about this? Well, he tells us we provoke and we envy one another. Both are driven by pride. Envy says, I want what you have to raise me up. Provoking is this kind of powering up. I'm going to bring you down to where I am. It's all, see, life under the law is a life that is filled with comparison. That's what it is. It's exaggerated glory because we're comparing ourselves. So the first diagnosis is this. Do you, are you jealous of others? You compare yourself to others. Do you envy others? Do you provoke others? Are you trying to bring others down by the way that you, uh, maybe it's an attitude, maybe the things you say. So look at what he says here. Watch this. Brothers, this is verse one. If anyone is caught in any transgression... You who are spiritual, by the way, that's not super spiritual. Anyone who has the spirit, any Christian, okay, any brother or sister, should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you be tempted. You too be tempted. Now, we think, oh, and let's not be tempted like they're tempted. But he said, no, no, that's not what he's saying. He said, lest you be tempted to become prideful, comparing, judging other people. And he's noting, now note this, this is important. This is for believers, it's best, it's usually best for Christians not to confront unbelievers about their sin. Be, because for two reasons. One, sinners sin, that's their job description. It's what, they, it's what we all do and before we come to Christ. And then we seek to, to allow his love, his grace to change us, the spirit in us. And here's the thing. Christianity is not about a better morality. They, they don't need a set of don't do this, don't do that. It, it, the challenge is not they need a new moralism. They need compliance to new rules. That's a distortion. That's a misrepresentation of Christianity altogether. It, it's like, like people say, well, Jeff, I would believe if there weren't so many hypocrites in the world. I mean, I know some non-Christians that are better than Christian people. 
And that's a shame. That's, that's horrible. Because as Christ transformed it, we should live out a high, the highest ethic of love more than anybody. But I, I say you'd have a great argument if the Christian faith was all about how well we're living and how ethical we are. That's not at the core of our faith. That may sound strange to you. The core of our faith is what Christ is. People don't need compliance to, to, to new rules or new moralism. They need Jesus. They need Christ. You can't follow a new moralism, the ethic of Jesus, the way of love, without Jesus, without his power in us. Martin Lloyd-Jones, who was a Welsh minister, um, gosh, he was the pastor at the Westminster Abbey. He was also a medical doctor. Brilliant guy. He, he writes this. Listen to this. Christianity is not primarily a teaching or a philosophy, nor even a way of life. It is before any, everything else, a relationship to a person. The New Testament, in a sense, will not even discuss with you the kind of life that we are going to live until we have come to the satisfactory answer about him. This is why we said Paul has spent five chapters talking about what Jesus has done for us. Focus on the gospel before he moves on to how, does this, how, do, how do we live this out. And then watch this. Martin Lloyd-Jones goes on. All along the Bible shuts us down. All along the Bible, the, sh- the Bible shuts us down to this one matter and holds us up against this one thing. It refuses to even discuss our questions and our problems with us before we can discuss how to live. What have you done with Jesus? What have you made of him? And y'all, that... That's fire. I mean, that is at the heart of of the Christian message. It's what Christ has done. It's why we can't move on apart from the gospel because it drives everything. And we become prideful because we, we think we can do it without his grace. But we've said you need a love that supersedes all loves. The, the, the issue is, is love out of order. And until you love Christ above all else, you'll never live the life he's called you to live. You'll be caught, okay, trapped in sin. Now, here's the thing. When you see someone trapped in sin, there's, there's a repetition, okay? There's, there's habitual sin. We're not just calling people out. I mean, I, you know, church, some churches do this. We, we come alongside. It says do it in gentleness. You see that? The spirit of gentleness. Watch this. One of the fruit of the spirit. What does it look like to live like Jesus? It looks like the fruit of the spirit. No, it looks like Jesus. It looks exactly like Jesus. But you, you don't go after people. Grace leads the way. And even Paul is saying here, you be careful. If you go after people, it just reveals your own pride, your own judgmental spirit. There are times we need to confront each other. But look, we do so in order to look at the purpose, to restore them. That's the word. This is an interesting word. Um, the word restore is, to, is, is a bone being set. It's like a dislocated bone. Sin is a dislocation. It's, it's a bone that's not in place. I, I've said it right, Augustine, it's love out of order. Sin is love out of order is what it is. And, and so we come in to restore. And he says, watch out. Are you going to fall into comparison, judging, being prideful yourself? So look, so how do we do this? Look at verse 2. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. I love that. We need to do a sermon on the law of Christ. I did a deep dive. Don't have time today. The law of Christ is the law of love. Uh, the law of Christ always asks the question, what, what would love require of me right now? Right now, in the moment. And, and, and we're to live this way, even in our confronting others. So, so one of the diagnostic questions is, are, when, are you judgmental? Because if you are, you're trying to come at people to raise yourself up and see how spiritual you are, how right you are. And in an interesting twist, no, you're revealing your pride. That's all you're doing. And look at verse 3. For if anyone thinks he is something when he's nothing, he, he deceives himself. Pride is self-deception. That's why it's hard for us to self-diagnose. Uh, you know, people say, man, love, love the sinner, hate the sin. You know, and I like to say, no, no, no. Love the sinner, hate your own sin. Because, because too many of us, we, we, we go after people uh, but another diagnostic question, are you serving others? 
Are you serving others? Uh, again, with a group of men this week, we, we gathered around after we served, and we're just talking about how amazing it is when you serve others and how joyful and how much peace and how, how joyful life can be when you're just serving others. But it's the love of Christ that motivates us to do that. We, we can hardly muster up enough to try to serve others. So the challenge I'm bringing to all of my church members, all right, all of you here who are members, or, or if you're a believer, this is a, what's your ministry? What's your ministry? Do you come even to church? Do you come to church to be a consumer? Then you become a critic. Are you a client? Right? Are, are, you, are you just here? Or are you here to serve? Are you watching for ways to serve? Because we've got a million ways for you to serve here. And, and it, it gets us out of ourselves, yes, and to, to release our pride. And, and, and we, we need to, we need to be, be loving towards one another when we find ourselves in sin. I mean, I've had to wrestle with this this week. I ha- I've had a good friend who has, who pastor friend f- s- slipped into s- some kind of sin and became rather public and people, everybody got an opinion about how it ought to go down and what took place and everybody's got, and it just reveals a lot of our pride, provoking, envying, all the things. And we need to come at it with truth and grace, always, with everyone involved in whatever it might be. Now, let's close with this. I spent a lot of time on that. Secondly, I got two, two points here. The solution to pride he gives us. Look at this. Let the one who is taught the word share all good things with the one who teaches. Okay, this is uh, uh, honoring people who, uh, who are teaching. Look at this, verse 7. It looks, like looks kind of like a non sequitur. Like, wait, I thought he was talking about pride. Now he's talking about something else. Okay, watch this. Do not be deceived. God is, God is not mocked. You cannot, you cannot fool him. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. There's this cause and effect in creation, spiritual laws as well that govern our spiritual walk with God. He says if you plant an apple seed, you're never going to get an orange tree. Not going to happen. This goes all the way back to Genesis 1. Seed according to its kind. Whatever you put in the ground is going to come up. So whatever you, sowing thoughts of pride, focusing on yourself constantly is going to just lead to a life of pride. But if you humble yourself before the grace of God, it changes your life and you live a life that is sowing into others the grace of God that he's given to you, truth about your sin. See, so many of us, we are, uh, gosh, we're, what do you put in your mind is the good question. What, what is real? Think about it. See, a lot of us, we're, we're into this kind of cable news discipleship right now, or, or your favorite podcast or commentary, and instead of listening and, and being in the Word of God. Like, you're, maybe you're not in a connect group. Maybe today you need to join the church. You need to finally say, I'm in, because you're, you're filling your mind with all the things that are simply going to end up reaping anxiety in your life. Because you're not in the word. Look at verse 8. For the one who sows to his flesh will from the flesh reap corruption, but the one who sows from the spirit will reap the spirit, reap eternal life. And Zoe life, like real life. See, what are you, what are you doing? Are you, are you sowing the word of God into your life? And here's what I want to say too. We've got a baptism coming up in a couple of weeks. We're doing an outdoor celebration of baptism. We're going to have baptism next week. But if you've not yet been baptized, I want to challenge you to do so. Because this, it's a big catalytic moment for you to proclaim to the world, this is my decision. I'm not going to live for myself. And watch this. We die to ourselves, okay? Like Jesus, we're raised up again in this new life, which has already happened because of our faith in him. It doesn't happen in the moment. We're totally forgiven. But watch this. Let's close with this. What's the standard, the standard of a life without pride? Well, two things. One, he says, persistence in doing good. Don't give up. Some of you have been serving and you're serving well. Some of you need to start. Those of you who have been serving, don't give up. Don't stop. Don't give up. Let us not grow weary of doing good. For in due season, some of you hear this today, we will reap if we do not give up. Don't give up. Look at verse 10. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone. Say everyone, everyone, everybody, and especially to those who are in the household of God. We're to start here, friends. Again, we've got a million opportunities for you to serve. What's your ministry? Like, like Abby or Nathan or others, where are you serving? Practicing the law of love. 
the law of Christ, where Paul says, if you live like this, what Galatians 5, 22, 23, he says, against such things, there is no law. They're not a law. You just freely love others. You, you put your head down and do what God's called you to do. You don't have time to be provoking and envying, comparing yourself to other people. You just serve him. And those of you who are doing this well, I want to encourage you, don't give up. But listen, the standard of a life without pride is Jesus Christ himself. He hunted you down. He is the standard of a life, not simply in his example, but because he came after us. Many of us don't want to get involved in people's lives. If I step into ministry, it's going to get messy. It might cost me some time. I'm having to give up an hour or something throughout the week. I mean, it's going to just readjust my life. I just, you bet it will. Because there's no love without sacrifice. We said that you know, perfect love casts out fear. You could argue the opposite of love is not hate. The opposite of love is self-protection. Love is self-opening. It's self-giving. Yes, it is self-sacrifice. The happiest, most joyful people I know are those who are serving others. We saw it again this week. I mean, we're all blown away like, this is the life I want to live. And we all do this because we know that there's been one who's carried the greatest burden of all. You and I were crushed under the burden of our sin. And the Bible says in Isaiah 53, verse 4, he was crushed for our iniquities. Jesus took it all on himself, showed us what it was. How about this? He sowed into his own body our sin. His body was sown into the ground. He was buried and raised again so that we might then, he reaps within us eternal life and a life that we've been called to live and to bear one another's burdens because he has done so for us in him. We don't get a new set of rules. We get a new heart. And it changes everything. And so now, here it is, good boasting. Now we boast. Will you join me in this as we close? Will you, let's boast only in him. Only in what he's done. Let that be our boast. Let that be what we want people to see. Because Paul is going to say it. We're going to look at it next week. Chapter 6, verse 14. I will boast only in the cross of Jesus Christ because of what he's done for me. And friend, can you say that about your life? This is the kind of church he's called us to be. And, and, and I just want to close us with, with a word of prayer. Some of you may have never made a decision to follow Jesus. You've been prompted to say, man, I need to, I need to join the church. I, I need to get in a connect group. You need to be baptized. What is God? What are you going to do? with this message. Because here's the thing, and for some of us, we need to know this. We've learned this week, whether pauper or king or queen, someday you're going to face eternity. And from what I've read, what I know of the queen, I think she knew our Savior. I'd like to think this week the queen met her king the one who died for her. Are you ready for eternity? Are you ready to live for him in the here and now? Let's pray together. Lord God, we thank you so much for your grace. Jesus, we praise you for what you've done for us. We thank you for the gift of life, for the gift of family, for the gift of children, for the gift, this beautiful vision of the church that you've created for us to be together, to live together, and to love one another, and to carry each other's burdens. And Lord, I pray that we'll do so in response to the fact that you have carried us. You didn't stop when it got really messy. You gave all for us. So friend, if you've never received Christ, you can do so now by faith. Just say yes to him. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross for me. Lord, rid me of my pride. Let me respond to your grace as I give my life to you. Make me the person you've called me to be. Lord, we love you. And we go now to serve others. In Jesus' name we pray. Everyone said, amen.